Welcome to Passion. For more information about Passion, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. Because it, it's, it's a powerful, you leave me alone there because you, you're going to hurt me. All right. Uh, we started this new series last week called Beginnings. I'm thankful for our worship team, by the way. I <laughs> don't ever want to miss that. We're blessed. Oh, y'all, didn't, y'all, y'all, weak. We are blessed. All you got to do is visit somewhere else one week and understand we are blessed. And I'm thankful. I don't want to take them for granted. I'm thankful for the hearts to lead us into worship. We started talking about beginnings, and you'll remember that I said I'm not a big New Year's resolution guy because I already broke mine, which was not to drink any Coca-Cola. That lasted about 30 seconds, and then I drank one. <clears throat> and so I'm not a big New Year's resolution guy, but I am a guy that thinks that at the beginning of the year we should think about beginnings. And I told you last week that uh, in order for things to go right in our life, we must reorder our life. And I ask you this question. I hope this question has kept you awake over this week. I really have been praying that you wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Thanks, Pastor. I appreciate that. But I really have been praying that this wouldn't mess with you because it's messed with me. The question I posed to you last week is what is the indicator to those around you that God is at the beginning of your entire life? I know we can fake it and we can put on airs and try to convince people by what they see that we're more godly than we really are, but I want us to really think about that question again for just a moment. What about your words? What about your actions? What about your attitudes? What about your behavior indicates to those around you that God is number one in your life? Because if there are no indicators, how would they know if you're just like they are? And so I challenged you to reorder your life. I I told you that we Uh, To to place God at the beginning of everything would not happen by accident. I hope that across the course of this week that you've intentionally made decisions that would cause God to elevate in your life. You will remember that I also stated that, that Jesus is in fact the glue that holds our entire life together based in Colossians which teaches us that in Him and everything was created and all things are held together. Jesus is the glue that holds our life together so if your life is spinning out of control control then you're missing glue and his name is Jesus and so this morning I want us to continue our look at beginnings because I think we need to go back to the beginning and learn lessons and so I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and read more than we read last week because we only got four words in our text last week so I'm going to expand it this morning Genesis chapter 1 in a little bit different version the message Bible says this first this God created the heavens and the earth, all you see and all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird over the watery abyss. And God spoke, light, and light appeared. And God saw that the light was good and separated light from from dark. And God named the light day, and he named the dark night. It was evening. It was morning, day one. Then in verse 14, God spoke, lights, come out, shine in heaven's sky, separate day from night, mark seasons and days and years, lights in heaven's sky to give light to the earth, and there it was now we're reading that I love this statement we're reading that in the past tense so there it was but if we had been around that day we would have said something we would have heard it like this or said y'all know who there it okay (laughs) sorry I've been wanting to do that all week I even went and listened to the song again because if we had been present on that day it's not past tense it's present and there it is that's the power of Y'all think I'm corny, don't you? Yeah, Tina's going, eh. I understand. Y'all just got to bear with me. Verse 16. God made two big lights, the larger to take charge of the day, the smaller to be in charge of night. And he made the stars. God placed them in the heavenly sky to light up earth and oversee day and night to separate light and dark. God saw that it was good. It was evening. It was morning. Day four. If we're going to learn anything from the beginning, we need to slow down and read what happened in the beginning slowly. 
I, 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 I would venture to guess that none of you even actually caught because you've read that passage and learned that passage from children's church for so long that you never really listened to what actually took place. Because I know I'm just going to be transparent. For decades I read Genesis chapter 1 and never read it slow enough to really listen to what actually took place. And so I missed the lesson. Let me see if I can bring some light to light. Here we go. Notice in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, which I read to you where it says, God spoke light and light appeared. And he named the light day and he named the dark night. It was evening, it was morning, day one. That's not that profound, Steve. Hang on. Because the Bible declares that at the moment that God opened his mouth and the word light came across his lips, that this light and dark separated light exploded onto the stage of creation and he separated day and night just by the sheer power of his word. I want you to go back, though, and I want you to examine again verses 14 through 19 because that passage of Scripture doesn't deal with day one. It deals with day three. Day one, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and it separated light day from night. But on day three, he steps back onto the stage of creation, and on day three, Three says, in creative genius, speaks another word. And suddenly this ball of fire that burns at 27 million degrees Fahrenheit plows into the morning sky and sun arrives. Oh, y'all are not with me yet. And then in a moment of inspiration, awe-inspiring, love-inspiring, song-inspiring, He speaks the word and this glowing orb of reflection catapults into the night sky known as the moon. Are y'all listening to me this morning? Did you catch it? He creates light on day one. Come on now, stay with me. Yet he waits until day three to create the sun and the moon. And the stars. So my question is, is what sustained the light that he spoke into existence on day one if he waited until day three to create the systems in our natural universe to actually continue and sustain that? What did, how? Here's the truth. From the very first moments of creation, we come face to face with the sheer power and force of God's word. God talk is so potent and so powerful that even when there are no natural support systems in place to perpetuate the light that he's created, light remains. Oh, y'all didn't catch that. Even though there was nothing naturally to sustain the light that he had already spoken into existence, the power of the sheer word that he spoke continued to perpetuate the light until there were natural systems put in place to sustain that light. Now you say, well, why is that important? Because one of the lessons that we need to learn from the very beginning is that you need to hear God talk. In your individual daily life, you need to hear God talk. Why? Let me give you several reasons. This is where I need Derek back. Here's my run. Y'all just hang on. First of all, because God talk will sustain you. Uh, Jesus, the very Son of God, in the flesh, understood that truth. You will remember in a moment of trial and in a moment of temptation that Jesus has this dialogue with the enemy of our soul, Satan. And he responds to the temptations and the trials that Satan places before him with this statement. You cannot live by bread alone. You remember? You remember what he says you live by? 
He says you are sustained by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus knew that there will be times in our lives. Jesus understood that there will be moments in our lives when natural means of sustenance just won't get you through. I'm preaching right now and y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. There are moments in your life when all of the systems that you place around you to sustain your life will fail. There will be moments when lifelong friends that you thought you could always count on will walk away. There will be moments when family members that you thought had your back will not get your back as protection, but they will actually take a knife and stab you in the back. They will let you down. There will be moments in your life when everything won't go as planned, where everything will fall apart where everything will go the wrong way they will not sustain you and so Jesus knew that the lessons of Genesis 1 is this that only God's word can sustain you in spite of lack of natural systems of support Some of you depend on your job as a system that supports you. I got news for you. That job may just dry up. That well of provision may just dry up. And if you put all of your eggs in that basket, at one moment in your life that could be taken away from you and depression could come in and discouragement could come in if that was the thing that was sustaining you because those things will not sustain you. There will be moments in your life when no one will support you, no one will applaud you, no one will agree with you, no one will encourage you. But if you will get a word from God, you can still make it. There will be times that everybody's going to look at you and tell you that you're crazy to keep on. Ever been there? Ever been there where everybody that was cheering for you is now sit looking at you going, you're nuts, give up. Anybody else ever been there? I've been there. I got one person that's been there. Anybody else been there? When the very people that used to cheer you on and applaud, oh, you're so good. You're doing so good. Now they look at you and going, you're crazy. Look around you. You're just wearing yourself out and nothing is changing. Why don't you just give up and throw in the towel and quit? But if you have a word from God, his word does not need any natural support systems to support itself. Everything can go wrong and everything can dry up and everybody can walk away. But if you would get a word from God for your life, in spite of all the lack of support, it will continue. It will continue. Let me say it like this. A wordless world was a dark, unproductive, chaotic place. You need to make practical application in your own life this morning. And that is this, a wordless life is a dark, unproductive, chaotic life. Too many of you are wandering through life and you can't seem to find your stride. Your life is being marked by circling. You keep repeating the same patterns. You repeat the same patterns of depression. You repeat the same patterns of disillusionment. You repeat the same patterns of addiction. You, break, you, you repeat the same patterns of broken relationship. You continue. It's like you're just going in a big old circle. You're banging your head up against the wall, repeating the same things over and over again. May I submit to you this morning that it may just be that the dark chaos in your life that is blanketing every decision you make is a direct result of a wordless life. So my challenge to you as we begin this new year is this. Do you have a word? Why? Because a word will also not only sustain you, a word will bring peace. See, your storm won't be silenced by antidepressants or another chemical or another container. Your storm won't be silenced by someone to sleep with. Or your storm won't be silenced by a nicer car or a nicer house or a nicer group of friends. The only thing that can calm the storm inside of you, because the storm is not out here. The storm is in here. The only thing that can silence the storm in you is a word. From the peace speaker who can arrive on the ways of your life and say, peace, be still. Do you have a word? 
We need a word because not only does it sustain us and not only does it bring peace, it also brings healing. Go home and find your servant will be made whole. One word overrode all this, the, this, the, the, the um, predictions and the diagnosis of the physicians in that community. One simple word. I came to tell you that in the sickness of your life, if you could just get a word from God, that will cause your sickness to dry up. That can cause your sickness to fall off. That can cause your sickness to be made whole. Do you have a word? You need a word because not only does it sustain you and bring peace to your life and bring healing into your life, but if you would get a word, it will also bring provision into your life. He spoke a blessing. That's just a word. He grabbed a measly amount of loaves and a small batch of fish and blessed them. He spoke a word over them and broke them and thousands ate. I came to tell you this morning that if you would get a word from God that a word can make your measly little earnings. Anybody feel like your earnings are measly? I feel like that sometimes. My, my, my earnings are kind of measly. I, I'm not making six figures of anything. Neither are most of you. And there are moments when we don't know where the next dollar is going to come from. And I look to my, my what I think is my source, which is my the person hiring me and writing my paycheck. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you look at your boss like he's the source. But I came to tell you this morning that your boss will never be able to give you a word that will cause your small earnings to multiply. If you could just get a word from God, it can cause the very things that you don't think can stretch, stretch further. It can cause your dollar to become like silly putty. know how I can make it, but it just keeps stretching. My car should be out of gas. The light's on, but I keep driving. Do you have a word? You need a word from God not only because it sustains you, not only because it brings peace, not only because it brings healing, not only because it brings provision. Here's the one we won't like and the one you'll rebel on me with, but here we go anyway. You need a word from God because God's word will bring a pruning. <laughs> See, we like the providing part. Preach, pastor, preach. I want my, my earnings to be expanded and multiplied. And then I say pruning and everything goes. <laughs> we need to understand that God's word not only provides, but God's also word also prunes. The Bible declares that God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides and it cuts if we aren't being challenged to remove anything out of our lives, then I would submit to you this morning that I doubt very seriously that you even have a word from God. Because at the moment you hear a word from God, not only will it provide for you, not only will it bring peace into your life, not only will it sustain you, not only will it heal you, but it will challenge you to cut something off from your life because God's word is a pruning word. So if you're not being challenged to cut anything off, you probably don't have a word from God. See, one of the things that stands between us and the providing word that God gives and our ability to receive and walk out that word is that we won't embrace his pruning word. Now, y'all ain't listening to me. You won't shout me down during this part. You want to embrace his providing word, but you won't have nothing to do with his pruning word. And so what we do is we think that or believe that there are certain areas of our life that must, must or can coexist with him. Bless me, Lord. I ain't going to give this up, but bless me anyway. God's going, it doesn't work like that, bub. Keep dreaming. I, I need financial provision. Yeah, but I'm asking you to quit wasting all your money. Oh, y'all won't make it. I just I can't make ends meet. Yeah, but you're spending 70 bucks a, a month going up, smoking it away. We don't want to be pruned. Are y'all going to, ah, y'all the smokers. He's, he's cutting. He's, yeah, but what about us that don't smoke but waste all of our money on, on, <clears throat> on Big Mac or Blockbuster? Come on now. We 
go, God, I think you my I can get providing word and this other thing, my habit can still exist. Uh, I can get providing word, but it doesn't mean I have to prune any of these people off of my life. I, 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 need, I, I want your providing word, but I don't want to get rid of anything. Listen, most of us resist it when God subtracts. We want God to add. We like his addi- addition word. We just don't like his subtracting word. But I came to tell somebody that you need to get a word from God and you need to embrace the word from God for your life. And there's a very real chance that that word won't just be a providing word. It will, in fact, be a pruning word. And it will require you to cut somebody or something out of your life. Do you have a word? You need a word because it will bring purpose. If you don't believe that, just listen when Jesus says to one of his disciples, You are Peter. At that moment, with one simple word, a fisherman's destiny is changed, and he now becomes the cornerstone of our church. In one simple word from from God, a a man that has been a murderer and has been vicious towards a believer, riding down a road, it gets knocked off his high horse, and with one word goes from being a murderer to now being, instead of being Saul, now becomes Paul, and he becomes an apostle and a great Hero of the faith with one simple word I'm trying to tell you this morning that if you would hear God talk, your destiny would change. You would not be able to live the way you've been living. You would not be able to walk through life with no purpose. You would not be able to walk through your existence and never know what you were intended to do. If you would get a word from God, God would change your destiny and your purpose forever. Do you have a word? We need his word because his word brings pardon. All we have to do is go to the last days of Jesus on this earth, hanging on a cross, and listen with one word. He says, today you will be with me in paradise in one moment with no spiritual sound and keyboards, no smoke machine to get the atmosphere right. In one simple word, he takes a man that is destined to bust hell wide open, and in one moment, with one word, he changes his course, and he spends the rest of eternity with God in heaven because of one word. One word can bring pardon into your life. Do you have a word? came to tell somebody this morning that everything you have need of is never going to be found in promotion. It's never going to be found in full bank accounts. It's never going to be found in designer clothes or scores of friends or your name and lights. All of that, all that you have need of can only be found in the creative, life-giving, chaos-breaking, curse-breaking, sustaining power of God's Word. So here's the question. Is your life wordless? You need to know this morning that, and I think you already know it, but I'm going to state the obvious. There is a battle raging over the word in your life. You need to know that the enemy of our faith and our enemy of our heart and the enemy of our life is doing everything he possibly can to keep you from hearing or perceiving the word of God for your life because he understands that if you ever tap into, tune into, listen to the word of God over your life more than his word, that your life will change forever. And so he is fighting for all he's worth. So there are some things about God's word that you need to know so that you can be on guard. Three things quickly and then I'm going to end. The first thing that I want to state to you as we go into this new year is this. The word of God can be ignored. As powerful as the word is, it still can be ignored. Some of you have heard the word of God the Lord over your life and yet yet you continue to ignore it and you continue to run from it and the result is chaos. Some of you have heard a word from God over your life through my preaching. Some of you have heard the word of God over your life from somebody else's preaching. Some of you have heard the word of God over your life at a retreat or a camp. Some of you heard the word of God years and decades ago and you've been running from it for so long and your life is in utter chaos and you find yourself in a pattern of brokenness because you have chosen to ignore the word. 
I came to tell you this morning that an ignored word is a dangerous word. Because the very word that was supposed to create life at the moment that you choose to, to, to ignore it changes and goes from being a life-giving word to a word that begins to produce death. Did y'all hear that? Could I say that again? The word of God that he speaks over your life to produce life and light and freedom. If you choose to ignore it, God's word always is a two-edged sword. And that same word that was supposed to create life in you, when you choose to ignore it, begins to operate on the other edge, which it begins to destroy you. Because when you ignore revelation, you find yourself in situation. And some of you had revelation time and time again of what God has said over your life and you've chosen to ignore it. And you continue to find yourself bound by situation after situation. I want to challenge you this morning to go back and pick up the word that you've ignored because there, there is this thing that happens, God's word, I've already proven that to you, Genesis has the ability to perpetuate with no sustaining things around it. And even though you may have laid it down and either, even though it may look different now than it would have looked like if you'd embraced it on that day, you can still go back and pick up the word that God spoke over your life and it can still have positive effects for you. Everybody understand what I'm saying this morning? Don't ignore his word. Well, Steve, you don't understand. My situation has changed. I understand. That's what happens when we ignore. But that still does not in make his word invalid in your life. The second thing I want to say to you this morning is that God's word can be choked out. If you're not careful, the cares of life will choke out the word of God. If you get a word from God and you are not careful, you will allow things. The enemy will make sure of it. He will bombard your life with so many good things and so many bad things and just so many things that you won't have time to concentrate or to live out that word. I know y'all ain't never been that busy, but I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. If we're not careful, the cares of life will cause us to have no time to act. No time to read, no, no resources to set into motion. But I want you to understand this. If you don't catch anything else this morning, listen to me very carefully right now. You need to know that if God has ever spoken a word over your life, then you also, part and parcel with that word, at the moment you receive that word and you perceive his word for your life, at that moment you also have a mandate to protect that word and make room in your life and in your busy schedule, and in your checkbook to make sure that that word can come to pass. Some of y'all missed it. Well, if God speaks a word, it's on him. He's got to fulfill it. I understand that. But I also understand that there's a partnership that takes place. And when I receive the word of God in my life, I have a mandate at that moment to change how I live, change how I use my time, change how I use my finances, change where I go and what I do to make sure that there is room in my life for the word that I've heard spoken over my life. Some of you are choking out the word of God with other things. Let me ask you some time-revealing questions. How much time have you set apart this, word, this week for his word? How much time has been given this week to reading his word? How much quiet time have you allotted this past week to hear his word? And if the answer is zero or very little, then you are in essence choking out the word of God over your life. The third thing that I want to say to you this morning is this. The word can be missed. In John chapter 1, John states that Jesus was the word in the flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Y'all know that passage of scripture. You can probably quote it better than I can. Jesus was God's word in flesh. You do understand that correctly, right? And yet, in John chapter 1, you skip down to verse 11, and he tells us that Jesus, word in flesh, came and his own didn't even receive him. They missed him. How many times in Scripture is the word missed? Let's just face it real quickly. I can't get to them all. 
give me the permission for you to make it home. Jacob stumbles into a place where God was and didn't recognize it. You missed it. How about Pharisees and Sadducees, the most religious people on the planet? They had more attendance pins and than all of us put together. They were as religious as you can possibly be. And they missed the word in flesh. A woman at a well has an encounter with a man but doesn't realize that she's not talking to a man. She's talking to the word. And she misses it. Two disciples. What are we? Disciples. Two disciples are walking down a path. And as a traveling companion, they have the word. And they miss it. If they could miss the word in flesh, how much more likely is it that we often miss the word? I want to challenge you this year, don't miss the word. There will come a moment over the course of this year. It may happen this week. It could happen next week. It could happen three months from now. But at some moment in the course of this year, the word will invade your life. And it is our job to tune our ears and tune our hearts to listen and not miss. We got to make room in our lives for interruptions from the word. We got to turn the volume down on other things. We need to quiet the other voices in our life so that we can hear the voice. Scripture has assured us of one fact. Scripture says this the sheep will know the voice of the shepherd. But I stand here today and I submit to you that I'm not sure about that anymore. I'm not sure that the sheep know the shepherd's voice anymore, and it's not the shepherd's fault. His voice didn't change. It's not like he suddenly went through puberty and suddenly his voice, the tone changed. Now we, we just can't figure out who he is anymore. I mean, he was kind of talking like this and all of a sudden he went through puberty. And now he does say it. And, oh, I, don't, I, I missed you. No. Come on, give me a break. We miss the word of God because we don't know how to discern the word of God anymore because we don't listen close enough. The Bible says that God is still speaking. The Bible declares that there is a preceding word taking place. It's always, God is always saying something. In fact, I believe he's always saying something to me. I just can't hear him because I got my iPod too loud. I got my friends yelling in my ear. I got the TV on so loud. I got the concerns and cares of life so loud that I cannot hear. I can't get into a quiet place God forbid, I gotta have music on in the car. God forbid, I'm I'm, I'm trying to do eight things at once, but I gotta have some noise in the room. God forbid that I ever get still and listen, be still and know that I am God. So does that mean if we never get still, we don't know that He's God? I want to give you a simple but profound clue on how to hear the Word and to elevate the Word in your life. Anybody ever? Can I just be transparent with you for a moment? I hear about these preachers, and they stand up and say, I heard God speak, and it ticks me off. I had a conversation with a guy the other day, and he said he was going to go talk to this pastor in this other community about planting a church. And he told me that when he walked into this pastor's office to tell him, I'm going to plant this church in your community, I want your blessing, that the pastor looked at him and said, I already knew that, God told me. That makes me mad. I just don't hear that kind of stuff. I, I, I'm just being honest with you. Have you ever questioned how you hear from God? Doesn't it make you uneasy when people say, I, I heard God say it is on me. I never hear nothing. I hear crickets. It's like I pray and my prayers hit the ceiling and bounce back down and knock me down. It's ridiculous, right? Let me teach you this morning how to hear God. Are you ready? 
I'm almost done. Hang with me. This is profound here. Here you go. You ready? The more you read his word, (laughs) okay, (laughs) some of you checked out already. The more you read his word, the more familiar you become with his voice. That was good. That'll change your whole life right there. The reason you came hear him is because you haven't read his word. If you knew his word, the more you elevate his word in your life, the more likely it will be that the word will elevate your life. Our ability to believe and to operate on the word we receive is completely dependent on the word we read. Y'all didn't catch that. Yeah, get, get this MP3 file off the internet. Listen to that one statement again. I'll play it again for you right now. Our ability to believe and operate on the word that we receive is completely dependent on the word we read. Why? Because you can't live up to what you don't know. So I want to challenge you. You need to find a word for your life. Oh, okay, well, so what that means, Pastor, is you're telling me I need, to, I need to go chase after a prophet and get a prophet to stand up with some microphone and get him in a weird suit and stand him right in front of me and prophesy over me or prophesy alive, whichever the case may be. I'm not saying that people don't prophesy. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that since we no longer understand and no longer can discern God's word, we will buy anything. I didn't say go chase a word. I said find a word. You have to dig in his word to find his word. Please don't misunderstand me. I believe there are moments that I grab this microphone and I stand here and I am actually speaking the very words of God. I do not diminish the prophetic aspect of God's word, but I am telling you that if you go chasing after a word, you will buy a scam and you will find a charlatan most of the time, not all of the time. I've had people stand up and speak a word of my life and I knew it was was correct, not because I trusted them, but because I dug into his word and I recognized that what they were saying only reflected and was bounced off the fact of what they had read and applied in their life and it made it true not because they said it but because God said it you got to get a word quit waiting on a man to give you a word God gave you his word if we would go back and understand that without a foundation of his word in our life we will be scammed and we will be played. The beginning starts correctly to this year when we get a word from God. If you are going to start this year off right, you must hear, you must obey, and you must be sustained by the actual life-giving, curse-breaking word of God and I want to tell you that every Sunday morning I'm doing my best to shove word down your throat. But the reality is is that life will only come into your life when you receive the word that you get in here. But you go one step beyond that and you crack that dusty old book off at your house. And you get in a quiet place with all the noise turned off. And you quit buying what sister so and so says and what brother so and so says. And you get the Bible out and read it for your stinking selves and let it feed you. It will sustain you you what happens if all the natural support systems of your life fail what happens if your favorite preacher quits preaching i can't get a word steve doesn't teach anymore that's i am nothing but a natural support system i've listened to everything dd jakes has ever preached he's got to come out with something new so i can get a word No, get the word out. You've got it. How many of you got more than one Bible at home? Okay, put them down. How many of you got more than five Bibles at home? (laughs) How many of you got more than ten Bibles at home? Come on now. How many of you got a Bible on your phone right now? Most of our lives are wordless. Yeah, that's the church. We 
got more word than you can shake a stick at. You can't even get away from it. There's so much of it. And yet we walk through life and we find ourselves in chaos because we have no word. Let me tell you what I'm believing and I'm going to shut up. I believe that over the course of this year, either from this pulpit with this microphone, me, somebody else, or better yet, notice what I just said, better yet, standing or sitting next to someone during a Sunday morning, having coffee together in the lobby, somebody's going to look at you and they're going to just think they're talking, but at the moment they open their mouth, you're going to hear the audible voice of God speaking to you. It's going to sound like that person's voice, but it's literally going to be God speaking a word of life over you. But you got to come to the place where you just say it. Look at your neighbor and say, God sounds like you. That's scary, isn't it? I mean, God's got a thick Oklahoma accent. I'm telling you the truth this morning. Quit waiting on some prophet down the street. You are a prophet. If you know his word. I can't give anybody a word yet because we don't know the word. But if you would bathe yourself in the word, it would be like heavens opened up and when you're drinking that cup of coffee and you look at them and you go, mm, that's not me. You may not even think it like that. Maybe you're just drinking your coffee and the word comes out at work. Somebody's talking about their bad day, their, their three dog night. I don't know, what, whatever. Some of y'all won't catch that. You're too young. And out of your mouth, almost, almost like you've separated and you're watching the conversation, you hear yourself say something in like, grow up. Or there's a better way. At that moment, it wasn't you. I was talking to a young lady that her husband's left her for another woman, and you're standing there, and you you don't have anything to say. You just go, that was God's word. We've had it happen here, and I'm, I promise I'm done. That's my third closing, and I got to get going. We've had this happen here, so I know it happened. Not just a couple weeks ago, we had an individual walk into this church that literally had to make the decision, am I going to come to church today because I'm going to use all the gas that I have left for the week, and I've got no money. I don't know who it was. I don't want to know. But one of you. I don't even know why you did it. Yeah, I do. God. God's word began to operate in your life. And you walked up and took a $5 bill. I think it was 20. I think it was 20 you were told. You stuck it in their hand. That's abnormal. Why do we do that? <laughs> God's word. He said to do it. I had, a, I had a foundation that the Bible, I've read it. So it's operating my life. The Bible says that we're to bear one another's burdens. I understand that. So I begin to operate on the word that I already have. And suddenly word comes out of me. I don't even have to say a word. And I'm given the word. Y'all didn't catch that. Too complicated to understand. I just know what happened. I want to challenge you this week, this week and this year. Do you have a word? And if you don't, welcome to dark time. But if you will get yourselves a word, and if you already have a word, I received a word when I was a teenager that God had something for me to do. Some of you have had words when you were teenagers. Some of you just got a word. If you have a word, welcome to the light. Stand with me this morning. Father, this morning, this is my request we need word so I pray that what you would do over the course of not only today but over the course of the weeks to come and the months to come and this year to come I would pray that you would help me to preach your word but I've already prayed that before and I believe that you allow me to do that that's part of the word to my life that I have to preach the word I Father, we'll continue to protect this pulpit and make sure that whoever takes this mic brings the word. 
So I don't even need to ask you for that. That's a, that's a given. What I'm praying that you would do is I'm praying that all of us that sat in the pews and listened would be, go beyond just coming to church expecting to get a word from somebody. We would actually find the word of God over our lives. I pray that all the distracting voices, I pray that our busy schedule, I pray that all the schemes and the attacks and the snares of the enemy that would keep us from hearing your word would be destroyed in the name of Jesus and that your sheep would once again tune in to the clear, concise, life-giving word that flows out of your mouth on a daily, moment-by-moment Father, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice this morning that does not have a word for their life, I pray that they would suddenly have a deep desire to read your word because even if we give them a word, if they don't have a word base for it, they won't understand it. They'll miss it. I pray that if there's an individual under the sound of my voice that's been going in circles and fighting the same patterns over and over again, I pray that they would examine their life this morning and recognize that it could very well be that the darkness they find themselves on a regular basis is solely based on the lack of word that has invaded their life. Father, I pray for those that received the word a long time ago and they've ignored it, that they've allowed things to choke it out. I pray that right now, somehow, I don't understand how this works either, but I pray that it would happen. I know it can happen. I pray that somehow in the spiritual realm they would backtrack and they would go back to that word that they received as young men and women. And they would pick it back up. And even though their life situation has changed, I pray that that word would begin to create in them what it was intended to create. And that their entire future would change. I pray for sustaining word to overtake us. I pray for peace to overtake us. I pray for a healing word to come. I pray for a providing word to come. I pray for a pruning word to come. I pray for a pardon to come. Help us to find your word. And Father, we'll listen carefully. And even if natural support systems fail, we stand on this fact that your word never returns void and your word never, never fails we'll quit looking to everything else to support your word and we will just stand on your word and bank on that in Jesus mighty name we pray amen here's your assignment as you leave today after you give your cards with your email address to the ushers here's your assignment talk to God and let God talk to you. How do I do that? Simple. You don't even say nothing. Yeah, we did. I just heard God say, He loves me. I dismiss you this morning to find and listen and to discern a word from God as you listen to one another. Be blessed this morning. Thanks for being here. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion. 